Hey everybody, it's Miss Kennedy. I'm going to teach you today about genetic technology and all the different kinds of genetic technology there are. So I hope you enjoy. Let's start with some cats. These are my two cats. They're both sleeping in this little bed and I love this picture. It's so cute. So hopefully you do too. All right, so I want to go over some things you should definitely know, some things to add to your notes. Um, so a restriction enzyme is an enzyme that's used to cut DNA at a specific part. So enzymes, remember, do a lot of things in our bodies, um, but in this, in terms of DNA, enzymes act to cut open DNA. They're literally like scissors, so they can cut wherever you want to cut on a piece of DNA. Recombinant DNA is DNA that's been changed by adding something, some type of gene from another organism. So if someone took my DNA and added it to another person's DNA, that DNA would be called recombinant DNA because it's d DNA that's been changed or a new gene has been added to that DNA. And then splicing is where you basically the process of adding that gene from my DNA to somebody else. So you splice my gene for brown hair into somebody else's DNA and then they get the gene for brown hair. So that's called splicing. So those are three definitions to know and keep in your notes. So I'm going to go over genetic engineering first. This is just a general overview of the concept of genetic engineering. Um, so the first step is that a restriction enzyme is used to cut a piece of DNA from one organism. So in this picture, you have human DNA, and it doesn't just pop out of the cell. That's where the restriction enzyme comes in and actually cuts the DNA. So think about a pair of scissors coming in right over here to cut the DNA. That's, that's my attempt at drawing scissors. That's that restriction enzyme. I'm going to put RE. So the restriction enzyme comes along and cuts a piece of DNA, a specific gene that you want from a human cell, okay? Then that gene is inserted into the cell of another organism. So we have a bacterial cell here. It's been kind of cut open with that same restriction enzyme, okay? And then the human DNA is inserted into the bacterial DNA. So you have the human gene here, and the rest is bacterial. So this bacterial cell is in, bacterial DNA is inserted into a bacterial cell, and then that bacteria will grow using the human DNA. And the most common use of this is in uh, making insulin. So uh, people who are diabetic need a lot more insulin. Um, so scientists have found a way to make insulin outside of the human body to then put it in bottles to give to people who need insulin. So the same process that I just described is going to occur to make your insulin. So the insulin gene is cut out of the human DNA using that restriction enzyme. It's then added to a bacterial uh, sequence of DNA. And so we call that recombinant DNA. Okay, so we have this recombinant DNA right here. It's then inserted into a bacteria and that grows in a, a culture or just grows in a little plastic dish in a lab then <clears throat> scientists will come in extract the insulin and then they can use it for medical purposes to help people with their diabetes to save lives whatever so that is genetic engineering that's the main function and hopefully you feel like you kind of understand it so the ne next type of genetic technology i want to go over is called selective breeding it's a little simpler to understand and it's literally just where you mate two organisms of the same species, so two cows that have traits that you want, and maybe they're separate traits, like one cow has one trait, one cow has another, you mate them together and their offspring will have hopefully expressed both of those traits. So that's kind of selective breeding, you're picking the traits that are then shown in the offspring. Um, and a lot of common examples are dogs. Most dog species have been bred for desirable traits, whether it's their fur color, their size, their demeanor, like their attitude. Uh, many, many dogs have been selectively bred over the past hundreds of years to get desirable traits. Um, another common example is cows. So this cow here, it doesn't have very good beef like to eat, but it is really good at um, staying cool and resisting heat. And this cow here, it has really great beef, but it's not good at staying cool. It gets really overheated. So uh, farmers actually bred these two cows together to create this cow that has great beef and is really heat resistant. So that is a really great example of selective breeding. It benefits farmers. It benefits the people that eat the beef and everybody's happy, except maybe the cows. And another great example is food. A lot of our food is selectively bred. It's also called artificial selection when you're talking about food. So you cross 
two different foods together to get something more desirable. So you have a really small but red tomato and you cross it with this really big green tomato to get a big red tomato. So those are the kinds of tomatoes we see in the store. They have been selectively bred. So that's something to think about the next time you pick up a tomato. Many, many of our foods have been selectively bred to get traits that we desire. So again, selective breeding, you're forcing two things to mate to get traits that you want from both those two organisms in their offspring or their children. So the last type of technology I'm going to go over is cloning. And cloning is where you create an identical copy of a plant or an animal. So it's not a twin of an animal. It's an exact copy. Everything is identical. The DNA, it's an exact copy of whatever you're, you're starting with. So I'm going to go over the steps with you. It's a little tricky, but I'm going to try and make it not so confusing. So the first step is to get like kind of a free nucleus, an available nucleus. So you have to remove the egg, an unfertilized egg from the nucleus of a cell. Okay, so that's what's happening here. So you have this unfertilized egg cell. Okay, and that's the nucleus right there. You can put N. Okay, the nucleus is removed by a scientist using this little tool called the pipette. Okay, so now you have an egg cell without a nucleus inside of it. So that's the first step. The second step right here is to remove the nucleus from the body cell of the organism you actually want cloned. So we want to clone this sheep right here. It's beautiful and we want to make an exact copy of it. So we're going to take the cells, uh, body cells out of that sheep. That's what they're, these all are our body cells. They're not egg cells. Okay, so you take a body cell and then you're going to insert its nucleus into that egg cell that you just created. Okay, so now we have the nucleus of sheep, the sheep is going into this egg cell. Step three right here. So you're seeing step three that the eggs, the uh, nucleus of the sheep is being inserted into the egg cell. That is step three. Step four is that the embryo will start to develop and grow and is then inserted into another sheep. So a sheep that's going to carry the exact copy of sheep, the original sheep that we started with. Okay, so this is not the same sheep. It's a sheep that will kind of carry the clone. It's not its baby. It's just carrying the the clone in its body until it gives birth. Once it gives birth to that, it's not its baby, it's an exact copy of the original, and then you have that clone. So cloning does involve a lot of different steps, but you're taking DNA from what you want cloned, inserting it into an egg cell, that egg cell will then go into a different sheep, and that sheep will give birth to the clone. So that's cloning. And this is just a fun little side note, but this was the first successful cloning of a mammal. Um, her name was Dolly. She was a sheep. She was cloned in 1996. And this is her and her baby. Um, and then this is her and her surrogate mom. So that's Dolly when she was really young. And that's the sheep that gave birth to her, but was not her actual mother. Because remember, Dolly's a clone of another sheep altogether. So this was the first successful cloning of a, a mammal. And people were really excited about it and really freaked out at the same time. So this actually brings me to a question. So if you could... Would you change the DNA of your child? Obviously, you don't have to answer because we're not in class, but I want you to think about what it mean. If you had the ability to change your child, maybe make them taller, stronger, um, take away diseases from them that you know they might have, would you do it? So just start thinking about that because that will come back up later. Um, and with that, I want to present some advantages and disadvantages or pros and cons of genetic technology. So the pros are that if you are editing DNA, um, doing one of the processes we've just gone over, there's less risk of diseases and death based on genetic conditions. So if you're able to take out genes that you know might cause illness or death down the line, then you're kind of putting people at less risk of those diseases. So that's good. It's keeping them healthier. It's also increasing their lifespan. So making people live longer, making animals live longer. Um, this kind of stuff also genetic technology like selective breeding gives us cheaper, better food, which is good for our growing population of humans. Um, another pro is that children can have genes that their parents don't. So a lot of us want kids that are really, really tall, even if we're not really tall. So genetic technology could give us the ability to, to do certain things like that, give our kids things that we didn't have in our DNA. Um, and cons are that it is expensive. It's not an easy technology. Not everyone is able to uh, change their own DNA or their family or their children's DNA. Um, mistakes can happen. It is scientists that are doing these sorts of technology so things can go wrong. Um, another really, really big uh, key con is that there's less diversity in the world, which means that uh, if more people start to be editing their DNA, if there's more clones in the world of, of different species, and let's say some sort of disease comes to wipe out the population, 
similar to what we're seeing now, if everybody has the same DNA or the same genes that have been edited and then they're at risk of dying from that disease, then that could seriously wipe out our whole population. So if everybody's DNA is more similar, less diverse because we've edited it, that puts them at risk of not being able to fight off diseases if those diseases attack the genes that have been edited. So you want more diversity, you want everyone to be different, in which genetic technology, you're not really getting those differences. More people will end up being the same if you're allowed to edit DNA. And if we start cloning more of our food and some disease comes to wipe out that, that crop that we all need to survive, we'll be having a lot of issues in the world. So a lot less diversity, which is not a good thing in terms of disease and just the overall health of our planet. Um, there's also taught a lot of discussion about biases for people who've had their DNA edited. Do they get better opportunities in life? Is it fair because they can afford it? Um, and some people just argue that it interferes with the natural order of life. We're getting in the way of what should be, what nature wants, what, you know, whatever you believe in wants. So that's another con. And I want you to keep thinking about these things because we're going to keep talking about them. And I think it's an important discussion to have. So that's it for me today. I'm sorry this was a little bit longer. I just talked too much because I'm by myself. So I'm going crazy. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye, everybody.